Okay, so it's a pleasure to have Professor Herbert Weigel, who used to be in Syracuse, but now I think it's South Africa. And he's going to talk about quantum corrections to binding energies of BPS vortices. So Herbert. Okay, thanks Kuma for the invitation. Uh, okay, so to begin with, let me just send the birthday greetings and wishes to Bal from the Southern Hemisphere. So as Kuma mentioned, I was in Syracuse, but that's about 35 years ago when I first met Bal as a young, and I was a young uh, postdoc there. So, and, and in particular, the last decade, I've actually met, met him even more frequently when he often came to visit Stellenbosch and the National Institute of Theoretical Physics here. And in particular, I enjoyed his lectures um, at the Theory Summer School a few years ago that was held here in Stellenbosch. Uh, and I always admired uh, um, his enthusiasm for theoretical physics. Okay, and secondly, let me, of course, thank the organizers for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, my recent research work. Okay, so I'm just now going to start and share the screen. Okay, that should be this one in here. Okay, one more thing back. So as Kuma said, the title is the quantum corrections to binding energies of BPS vortices. Uh, and that has been work I've done in collaboration with Noah Graham from Middlebury College in Vermont for the past few years. So and we wrote up that uh, project in a couple of uh, PRD papers. And there is also an earlier a lecture note or monograph uh, explaining somehow the background of the methods that we are actually using. Okay, so let me go back a little bit in history because there is some of the many motivations for this study. Okay, so one of the many um, the motivations actually involves uh, Ball and his co-workers some three decades ago or something like that. Uh, so, and that's related to the famous H dibaryon in QSD, which you know, is a composite of two up, two down, and two strange quarks, which first was considered by both Chaffee in the MIT model, but quickly after, but also by Ball uh, in the SCIRM model. And what both of these two, two projects showed was that in these particular models, that H dibaryon was strongly bound. And a few years later, there was actually a paper coming here from Stellenbosch with Frank, Ricky Scholz et al., uh, indicating that the quantum corrections uh, to these binding energies of the H dibaryon may be substantial and they can actually uh, reduce uh, the binding and maybe the, the H dibaryon even un unbound in, so for certain parameters. Okay, But of course, with these calculations for the quantum corrections, there is a problem in the square model that model uh, is not renormalizable, so therefore such estimates uh, require approximations that are difficult to control, if at all. Okay. So the question is, is, in how far can one really make a statement on uh, binding energies of, of solitons with different topological charges? That's what it's all about, because the h baryon has topological charge 2, and an ordinary baryon to which it is compared has topological charge 1. Okay, so the challenge, therefore, is to get a handle on that is to find a renormalizable model that has static solitons with different topological charges. Um, and uh, these are uh, quite difficult to find. Um, in one space dimensions, it's easy to find renormalizable models with solitons, but with different topological charges, they are usually only copies uh, of a single charge mm, configuration. And in three space dimensions, the models are either not renormalizable or they're very they have very complicated uh, equations for the quantum fluctuations. Okay, so let me give a brief outline on what I'm going to talk about. So there will be a short introduction. I already gave some of that. And then uh, I will briefly discuss the classical piece of the calculation, which is the obvious cause of Nielsen Olsen string or vortex. Uh, I will then describe briefly the, those methods that we actually use to calculate the quantum corrections, which we call vacuum polarization energy. Uh, due to the singular structure of that vortex, there uh, are some real problems in there, and these problems can uh, 
already be illuminated and solved in a model where only the Higgs field um, is a quantum field and the, fluctu the quantum fluctuations of the gauge fields are ignored. But of course, once these problems have solved, that will go to calculate the VPE for the uh, ANO vortex in the particular in case that the BPS bound is uh, obeyed classically and should be some short call conclusions. Okay, so the starting point is a field theory with the classical localized solitons, and uh, we will look at quantum corrections. They should be small, but in some cases, they may never be the less be decisive uh, for selecting the correct, correct uh, uh, soliton configuration. Okay, so the soliton actually polarizes its harmonic fluctuations by inducing uh, potential for these fluctuations, and uh, this polarization gives a shift in the zero point energy, and uh, that shift in the zero point energy is the vacuum polarization energy after proper renormalization. So we have eigenfrequencies of the fluctuations in the background of the soliton and in the absence of the soliton, uh, which are mm, the latter I denote by the superscript zero in there. And that sum in here uh, contains both bound states and scattering states. And of course, uh, this thing needs renormalization. In three plus one dimensions, it, this would be quadratically divergent in general. Okay, so as I already mentioned, we are looking for theories with distinct topological solutions and want to ask whether the VPE is universal in the sense that if we can find the VPE for a certain topological charge, can we make some kind of uh, statement about the VPE for solitons with a different topological start? So in, in D equals one plus one, there are two famous soliton solutions to kink, but that has different topological charges, but they are just related by uh, overall reflection. So there's not really any distinction between the topological charges. And in the sine Gordon model, you can have solutions with higher topological charge, but they turn out to be non-overlapping unit charge combinations. So uh, therefore also, if, if there are not overlapping all the nonlinear effects fade away and uh, you can't make, uh, uh, or there, there is no real information in calculating the VPE of these higher topological charge configurations. There are also kink type solutions in higher polynomial uh, one plus one dimensional theories, but they have other problems. They have, have a mm. primary and secondary vacuum where the field potential has different curvatures at the different vacua, or the different degenerate vacua, and that may actually cause the uh, soliton to be unstable once quantum fluctuations are included. And as I already mentioned in three plus one dimension, we have all these many chiral soliton models, uh, but they typically emerge in non-renormalizable models. So uh, that's not really suited to calculate the VPE. And the particular case of the Apri because of Nielsen Olson vertex, which is embedded, which is an embedded two plus one scalar dynamic vortex, uh, and uh, that indeed is a renormalizable theory. And in particular, in the BPS case, it turns out that the uh, classical energy of a vortex with charge n is just n times the classical energy of the unit charge vortex. So therefore, the VPE would actually be decisive to calculate when calculating the binding energies of higher charge vortices. Okay, so the, the classical ANO vertex, well, it in some variants appears in many cases, for example, in, in cosmic strings, it's an embedded in SG2 electroweak theory, which has a uh, Higgs and massive gauge bosons, and uh, it originally might have occurred uh, to um, make up for the frustration of interfaces in regions would have different Higgs vacuum expectation values. And the one I'm here considering here, the ANO vertex is the for the magnetic flux in a superconductor and the uh, scalar field is simply this, uh, the condensate order parameter. And there are indeed two cases, depending on how the uh, higher charge energies look like or how they compare to the unit charge uh, energies. So if the the higher charge, ener charge uh, energies is less than n times the 
unit charge when they attribute lumps of vortices and otherwise there are isolated uh, single vortices because the binding energy would be negative. Okay, let me start by discussing or introducing the model Lagrangian. Uh, as I said, it's scalar electrodynamics. So we have the field strength tensor squared, a covariant derivative of a complex Higgs field or complex scalar field together with the Mexican hat potential that gives us the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the mass parameters are given in terms of the original coupling constant like the electric charge or the quartic self-interaction strength and the vacuum expectation value. So the Higgs field, which is the, the scalar field, uh, is mass lambda times V squared. And, uh, and the gauge field has charge twice the vacuum expectation value times the um, electric charge squared. So in three plus one dimensions, uh, V has mass dimensions one and E is dimensionless. In two plus one dimensions, both V and E have dimensions square root of mass. Okay, so now let's first look at the profile functions for the vortex, the classical vortex. And we are actually looking at this in, in singular gauge. Uh, okay, so we have just a scalar field, and I will argue why we use this singular gauge in, in a minute. Uh, the, the scalar field just has a single radial function and the uh, vector potential has a profile function g of rho uh, in azimuthal direction. And we already wrote everything in terms of dimensionless quantities where r is the physical length scale. Okay, so then you can calculate the classical energy, plugging that parameterization into the previous given, previously given Lagrangian. And uh, well, in two plus one dimension, that's just the energy. And in three plus one dimension, that's the energy per unit length. And with certain boundary conditions, again, in single gauge, where the uh, Higgs field vanishes at the origin and the gauge profile becomes one at the origin, that what actually makes it singular because it would behave like one over a row. And there's actually also another one over a row essentially sitting in the phi hat in there. So that's actually singular. Uh, but the point is that at spatial infinity, uh, the Higgs field just becomes a, a constant and the gauge field is, is just zero. So meaning that asymptotically in the singular gauge, the fields really turn into the zero vortex uh, solution. Okay. So one can now go, go on and calculate the or minimize that classical energy. And uh, if you do that, uh, in, again, essentially in units of, of V squared, and write that in terms of the ratio of the Higgs and the uh, gauge boson mass, you will indeed see that for uh, the Higgs mass being less than the gauge mass, um, and you have the type 1 configuration where the energy of the higher charge vortex is less than n times the unit charge vortex. And in the other case, you have type 2. And for the particular case of the BPS configuration where the two masses are actually the same, uh, you indeed uh, find that the n times the unit charge classical energy is just the uh, a classical energy of the vortex with topological charge n. Okay, so here I've also plotted uh, a few of these profile functions uh, for the, the BPS case actually. So, and the higher the topological charge, the wider the profiles. Okay, so now let me try to explain the way we're actually calculating the BPE. We do that from scattering data, and I will just give a brief sketch of what I call the poor man's derivation. So the, the soliton or the vortex generates a potential for the fluctuations about the classical configurations. And uh, we can set up that as an ordinary scattering problem, problem for which we can calculate uh, a phase shift. And if we discretize the states, because at the end or at, from the very beginning, more or less, the formula told us that we have to count those states. Uh, we just put it in an arbitrarily large box and demand some boundary conditions. And from that, you can first read off the number of states with momentum less than k and the derivative thereof, that's just the density of states. 
and we are only interested in the change of the density of states due to the interaction with the soliton. So we can we subtract from the derivative of n uh, in, of the full case the derivative of n without the phase shift, and uh, then all what's left over is the derivative of the phase shift and that's also known as the grind formula which tells us that the change in the energy of density of states is related to the derivative of the phase shift calculated from the scattering you know, of the potential induced by the vortex okay so and then that change in the state density can be transformed into the change of the, the energy which is now our continuum contribution to the uh, vacuum polarization energy. So it's just a change in the density of states weighted by the eigenfrequencies of the corresponding states. Okay, so of course there is a more fundamental derivation in quantum field theory, but we start with the uh, matrix element of the energy momentum tensor that we can write in terms of an integral of a Green's, of a Green's function at the um, incident points. Okay, so and the formula is given here. It looks a little bit ugly, but let me write you, uh, you through it. So, of course, you again recognize that there is the derivative of the phase shift sitting in there, but there are a few more things. So, there's a degeneracy factor trivially, and we have explicitly also to account for the bound states in the background of the potential. But the more important thing is that there are some square brackets around the phase shift with some subscript capital N. So what that actually is, it's not the phase shift by itself, but it's the phase shift with certain subtractions. And these certain subtractions are obtained from the Born series, which is uh, uh, the expansion of scattering data in terms of the potential V, which is generated by the vortex in there. And we, we subtract the number of uh, these spawn terms from the phase shift in such a way that this momentum integral actually becomes finite. Um, okay, so, and of course, what we have subtracted, we have to add back in. And the nice feature of these spectral methods is actually that there is a second way of writing the, an, uh, an expansion for the vacuum polarization energy in terms of the potential V. And these are just. Uh, Feynman diagrams. So you have the one loop, for example, of the um, ordinary free propagator in there, and then insertions at a given order of the background potential. More precisely, these are insertions of the Fourier transform of that background potential. Okay, and you can generate these Feynman diagrams by simply expanding the effective action uh, in powers of V. Okay. So, and in addition, as already mentioned earlier, we have to renormalize the theory. That, of course, is just given by adding pre described counter terms in there, which are also functionals of the background potential. So, these are counter terms that contain uh, expressions from the original Lagrangian, and in that in this expression, we just substitute the uh, classical configuration and Get a corresponding counterterm contribution, and the coefficients in there are predetermined from some conditions on the uh, Green's function. So that means at the end, when you combine the Feynman diagrams and the counterterms, that is also a finite quantity. So that means we have now been able to express the vacuum polarization energy as a sum of individually finite uh, pieces in there, and. Uh, no additional cutoff is actually needed. Okay, so and also the standard renormalization program can uh, completely be incorporated uh, and uh, without any ambiguity. The only drawback in here is that the potential that's showing up in there should allow for a partial wave uh, uh, decomposition. Otherwise, we cannot apply these techniques. But essentially, it tells us that the if we have scattering data, we can calculate the vacuum polarization energy. There is one drawback in there is that the various components uh, in that calculations, for example, the Feynman diagrams, they don't necessarily uh, reflect all the symmetries of, of, of the theory. So that actually means that the variance of 
with respect to those symmetries between the phase shift contribution and the Feynman diagram contribution, they actually have to cancel. Okay, so and if we were in two plus one dimension and calculate the VPE of the vortex, we could indeed just use that formula. Okay, so in, the, in a mildly channel generalization uh, of the problem, um, that phase shift simply goes into the lock of the determinant of the scattering matrix. Okay, so how do we calculate all these quantities in particular for the scattering distribution? So that's what called the Caligero method, or it's also called the variable phase approach. Okay, so I just will very briefly introduce that for D plus one and also only for the anti-symmetric channel. So the idea is actually to turn the linear wave equation uh, into uh, a nonlinear equation by writing exponential fa factor to what, uh, in addition to the Blaine wave solution in there and then substitute that into the wave equation. And of course, that's now nonlinear with some certain boundary condition that actually asymptotically uh, the wave function is just a plane wave. And uh, then this quantity is, is uh, what's called the Yost solution uh, uh, in scattering formulas in there. And the physical scattering solution is just the one that's regular at the origin. So you take uh, the solution up here, the full wave equation was real. So the complex conjugate of that quantity is also a solution. You take some linear combination of these guys and the factors in these linear combinations are nothing else but the phase shift. So if, if you require that the phase, wave function is regular at the origin uh, and you have the solution for beta sub k of x, uh, the phase shift is just the real part at x equals zero. Okay, so there are some subtleties with the symmetric channel in D plus one dimensions, but that's not relevant here. The most important use of that category uh, equation of um, is that it easily gives you the Born expansion by iteration. So we write beta as beta of one, which is first order in the potential, beta of two, second order, and so on, and simply linearize uh, the equation to get beta of one. Okay, so then the potential is nothing else but the source term for beta one. And at second order, the square of beta of one that we calculated here is the source term for the second order term. And then the corresponding uh, phase shift born terms are nothing else but the respective real parts uh, of beta at the origin. Okay, so that's what works in two plus one dimension. Then in three plus one dimension, things are a little bit different because uh, we have to integrate over the momentum of the translational invariant subspace in which the vortex is embedded. In principle, that gives an additional singularity, which is uh, or infrared singularity, which cannot be remedied by uh, born subtractions because the phase shift does not at all depend on that momentum, but there are some very fancy uh, sum rules for scattering data, which are generalizations of Leibniz and theorem that actually tells you that the residue of that singularity uh, actually is zero. Okay, so and then you can uh, do uh, the calculation in there and what, what's remaining in there is an additional power of the frequency together with some logarithm that typically shows up uh, when you apply dimensional localization. Okay, so how do we do the calculation? Well, we introduce the Yost function. I didn't go into detail in there, but essentially that can be uh, obtained from the Yost solution at uh, the origin or the center of, of the potential. And this function is analytic for uh, in the upper half plane and uh, for real k, the, the uh, the real part of F is even, the imaginary part which gives the phase shift um, is odd. And the most important uh, property is that the Yost solution has, the Yost function has zeros at exactly the bout state wave, fun wave numbers. So we do our integral, turn it from the integration on around the real axis into a contour integral. The semicircle at infinity actually does not contribute because we have all these form subtractions which makes this the integral finite in there. And the and the the poles that arise from the derivative of the logarithm of the Yost function, they are actually uh, sitting uh, at the zeros of the Yost function. That's the position of the bound state. 
So these poles exactly cancel the explicit bound state contribution. And the only thing we have to, to be careful about is, is that we have to avoid the cut that comes from the logarithm in here. So we, we uh, bypass that cut by integrating along the imaginary uh, axis starting at IM. And M here is the smallest mass in the, the whole game. And so therefore, all what we need to do is to, to solve that differential equation for uh, the used solution on the imaginary axis. And uh, the important point in here that you see then is uh, that uh, the bound states do not appear explicitly anymore. Okay, so <clears throat> we set up the theory and, and the procedure. But the point is that the A and O vertex has different singularities from the gauge fields, but they only appear in the wave equations for the Higgs fluctuations. Okay, so and they cause various problems. For example, they uh, disallow us to calculate Fourier transforms of the background potential, which is an ingredient for the Feynman diagrams. Okay. So, and also the use function by itself is not gauge invariant in contrast to the phase shift. So there are eventually some quadratic divergences uh, that show up in the gauge variant uh, formulation uh, of the theory of the quantum fluctuations. And that's actually encoded in this function U of T that we get from the use function uh, being a constant as the imaginary momentum goes to infinity. So of course, that constant may be dropped, so I would call it non-dynamically, since only the derivative uh, of in that u of t ended in the in the first place in the Grind formula. Okay, so the fluctuation equation for the the Higgs part in there involves these radial functions eta, and you see immediately that radial function has two components. One is coming from the regular Higgs potential. There's no problem with that. And the other one is coming from the gauge potential or the gauge field in the air, and that has a one over rho uh, singularity sitting in there. Okay. Uh, and uh, the question is simply how do we deal with that? Okay, so let's have a look at all the superficially divergent one loop diagrams that we got from the expansion of the effective action. And uh, let's, for the time being, uh, disregard gauge invariance, so we have to to discuss all of them, so there are 12 of them, and uh, well, the straight lines in here are just the Higgs field or the scalar field and then the curly line. Herbert, sir, Herbert you have about 10 minutes. Okay, I, I know, okay. Yeah, uh, and uh, the, the free transforms of the, of the vortex profiles are the external lines. Okay, so if you only have this, 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 this scalar field in the air, there's no problem in the air. We just iterate the wave equation with a, a gauge field set to zero, but there are quadratically divergent pieces in there coming from the insertions of two gauge pieces in there. And in a gauge variant sharp, sharp cutoff regularization, you immediately see that uh, that quantity is quadratically divergence for d equals four. And uh, we can also extract the strength of, of that divergence in there. It's just the spatial integral over a mu squared. Okay, so how do we deal with, with these guys? Actually, we can also write a Born series from them, but it's a little bit more complicated. We need a single Born approximations for the two photon uh, or two gauge field insertions, and we need two uh, mm, Born terms for the second order diagram in here and we if we collect all these bond terms we actually indeed see that uh, when you calculate that mu of t from uh, that particular uh for, or for from those particular bond terms in here and uh, do not go actually at to row to zero but to some very small minimal row in there, that's the same as this integral we had previously, also with a cutoff at the lower boundary of rho min, at least when t is large. And that's where the singularity, the, the ultraviolet divergence shows, shows up. Or we can do it the other way around. We, we simply do not consider these ultraviolet divergences and simply just subtract the contributions from the Higgs field. Uh, and 
that would mean that that part of nu of t should indeed go to the same integral in there with a lower cutoff uh, rho min. Okay, so there's some numerical examples here, so don't go into to that one. So the, we have to take this, the limit where the number of partial wave goes to infinity, but what is actually large in there. And if you look at the figures in here, uh, you actually assume that for moderate t already things seems to converge, even though large l's are indeed uh, uh, needed in there. And if you go to to a logarithmic plot in there, you can actually read off uh, a power law from that uh, um, seemingly appearing uh, convergence. But that power law is wrong, okay? Because it this would actually uh, require or induce that the integral uh, t of nu of t would be finite, but it should be log divergence. And to, well, what actually needed is a more careful consideration of these Feynman diagrams. And if, well, many of them actually disappear if you have gauge invariants or the singularities actually uh, cancel against each other. And uh, the two which are remaining in there can be calculated in dimensional regularization. And uh, the coefficient of the singularity is just the field strength square. So that's the standard wave function renormalization from the ultraviolet uh, divergence. And from that, you, you can read off uh, actually this, the coefficient of the one over t squared that should emerge uh, when you take t to infinity. And what you actually see in that calculation is that the corresponding limiting function that reproduces that singularity seen from the Feynman diagram is positive. That does not fit or does not agree with the calculation in here, but actually was negative. And the reason was simply that those moderate t that we considered earlier uh, are not large enough to actually see the correct asymptotic behavior. Uh, we have to perform a large L uh, extrapolation. And uh, that's very tricky because numerically uh, already L equals 500 is extremely difficult to accomplish. So we consider some values in the in the uh, vicinity of L equals 500 and then extrapolate to L going to infinity. And that thing then indeed shows the correct uh, asymptotic behavior. Uh, due to the, so we, we finally have the correct asymptotic behavior, but not yet fully renormalize the theory uh, because we cannot calculate the corresponding Born terms. The trick is here to introduce a fake boson which has the same asymptotics, but uh, has a well-defined uh, Born series. Okay, I don't want to go into the details of that, but let me simply go to the uh, VPE for the, the full scenario where also the gauge fields be, are quantized. So there are additional fluctuations in there. We have to fix the gauge for the fluctuations. That gives us uh, a Fadea Popov um, theory in there. And uh, the gauge fluctuations, they have tame, time and longitudinal contributions or components in three plus one the, the dimensions. They actually decouple from the transverse modes. And the three plus one, those uh, decoupled modes and the, the ghost fields actually fully compensate when calculating the VPE. And in two plus one dimensions, it's only one component that's calculated, canceled, but that can be easily uh, calculated because it just represents a simple uh, scalar scattering problem without any further singularities. Okay, I'm not going to uh, the, the details in here how we calculate the use function and the use solution. There are a few additional uh, divergent Feynman diagrams, but again, they don't cause any uh, further problems in here. So they just have to be calculated. Uh, and then we uh, introduce our renormalization conditions with this node tadpole theory that there is a local, the local diagram of one Higgs in insertion is fully canceled. And otherwise, we, we just uh, require standard on-shell renormalization conditions for the two-point functions that the, the uh, uh, actual uh, the residues of the propagators are one at the poles. And uh, then we also have require that there are no corrections to the Higgs max, mass in there. But altogether, we only have four counter terms, and these are already four conditions. So meaning that the, uh, 
gauge field actually acquire some random corrections, but for the calculations of the VPE, which is a one loop uh, object by itself, that the effect of that random correction is at a two loop order. Okay, so final two or three minutes. Let me just give a few numerical results. So a, a, a whole lot of calculations in there with many numerical subtleties, but only a few numbers show up uh, or, or number, in the numerical results. So for the two plus one dimensions, we get our results for the, the VPE with these various contributions from the counter terms and the Feynman diagrams. And uh, we can actually very nicely fit essentially a linear function to um, as a function of the charge of the vortex in there. The contribution from a quadratic term is, is actually very, very small in there. And if we calculate the binding energy from that fit in there, we actually see that it's um, always negative. So meaning then at least in two plus one dimensions, uh, the bind the uh, higher charged vortices are actually bound. Uh, and the same is true for three plus one dimensions. There, the quadratic term in the fit is even so small that I don't uh, uh, write it down in here. But again, the binding energies are, are negative. So that means in either case, either case meaning two plus one or three plus one, uh, coalesced uh, vortices are favored over isolated vortices. Okay, so this is uh, some data on the fake boson trick to check that. Okay, so let me come to uh, the conclusion. So I, I want to say only a few words about numerical uh, subtleties in there. So that actually took well, about 20 notes of uh, ordinary uh, um, in desktop computers to do calculations over a year or so. So it, it's not that trivial to begin with. And I think it, this is indeed the very first study of a vacuum polarization energy in a renormalizable soliton model with different, different topological sectors, which might be relevant for binding energies in the particle interpretation of solitons. Uh, since, but that's difficult to find any such models in D plus one or uh, three plus one uh, models in there. So, and uh, now here we had to deal with the vortex with the classical field was written in the singular gauge that was necessary to make actually contact with the free, free Green's functions uh, that's needed in, in the calculation of the VPE. And uh, we had to actually perform a singular structure. Oh, that singular structure required us to uh, add a non-dynamical zeroth or uh, born term, non-dynamical in the sense that in, both in the Krein formula, it would actually not show up because uh, the derivative with respect to the momentum of that term is zero. Uh, but once we perform that uh, zeroth order born subtractions, we comply with gauge invariance in the sense that we don't find any quadratic divergence anymore, or it's completely canceled. And uh, numerical subtleties, for example, were that uh, the converging sum over angular momenta uh, properties were very bad and required some extrapolations. There are additional extrapolations with the rho equal to zero uh, limit in there. But the main result is that the vacuum polarization of this BPS vortices approximately scale uh, with one minus n while the classical energy scales with n by itself. And uh, we find that for the, this case of the BPS vortices, the VPE stabilizes uh, the solutions with higher wi uh, winding numbers. Okay, so that's it. So thanks for your attention. And uh, once again, uh, congratulations on the occasion of Bal's birthday. Okay, so thank you, Harvard. Thanks, Herbert, for uh, the talk. Okay, uh, you're welcome. We have a couple of questions, uh, a little time for the questions first. Thanks, Herbert, for coming and okay. talking to us. Okay, then, uh, welcome. Just as a reminiscence, I knew Herbert, and he was a postdoc yep. at Syracuse, working yep. with Joe Schechter. Yes. And I remember that he was a fanatic soccer player. Yeah. Hey, Don't, hey, and I, no, no, I, I talk about soccer only in the presence of, of my lawyer since the last <laughs> World Cup. <laughs> but he had some problem with his leg, I think, even at that time. But still he played soccer. Yeah. 
in yeah. the ground near the Manly Field House. Yes, I do remember. Correct? Okay, yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, thanks again. Uh, okay. Maybe now there are more questions. Let us see okay. what happens. Hi, Herbert. This is Christian Gopal from MIT. Oh, hi. Hi, Christian. Um, hi, Herbert. This is Krishna hi. Rajagopal from MIT. Oh, hi. Hi, Christian. Um, and you can't see me, but I can see you. I just mostly like Bal. I wanted to say hi. Um, okay. Uh, so, so, so Herbert was a postdoc at MIT after he was a postdoc in Syracuse. Um, and we got to know each other then. And, and I will say it's a real pleasure for me to see your and Noah Graham's recent work. Um, for okay. those of you who don't know Noah, Noah was a PhD student um, of Bob Jaffe at MIT and began working with Herbert at that time. And clearly they have continued to collaborate very fruitfully for some number of years. Um, mostly I just wanted to say hello and great to see you. If, okay. I can, if, uh, if I can ask a question, this is a complete non sequitur from your talk, but it's in the same space. Um, so so that there, you know, given the sophistication of your ability now to calculate the interaction of solitons, um, do you think there's any prospect of um, skirmion-based models for nuclear matter um, uh, becoming uh, under better control, or is that is that uh, uh, still futuristic? Yeah, I think you're referring to the work of the group of Nick Manton. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, okay, or there, okay. I think there have been others too. I think there have been some others, but anyway. There, there have been, but, but I think Nick Manton's group, uh, he's not, all, not uh, co authoring all these papers, but uh, I think some of his students or postdocs have done a lot of work on that. Uh, so I guess, but my, my question is that th those treatments are initially inherently classical. And, yes. and, I'm, and I'm wondering whether the quantum corrections, you know, to, to, for, for it to become semi-quantitative, the quantum mechanics has to be taken seriously as you are doing in, in your yeah. context. And so I'm just curious whether you have a sense as to whether that's still futuristic or uh, within yeah, well, reach. I, the, the point is the square model by it, itself is not renormalizable. Okay, so I don't think there is any, so, so there have been some truncation methods and uh, uh, even some uh, physics reports written on that, but it's, so the problem on the square model is already much earlier, so it's, so yeah. if you look at the divergence structure, it's not even quadratically divergent, it's quadratically divergent. Okay, okay so that, that really makes it difficult. So the, the question is whether you could do some calculations including uh, vector meson interactions rather than this f famous SCRM um, uh, term. That could make the, the theory uh, renormalizable, right. but of course all calculations in there, the, Okay, so I think you need. I, I, I get it. So this, we could have had this that. conversation a few years back. This is that there's. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I wish you were here to join us for tea. We could we could continue it over tea then. But I, there, I think there are others with questions. No. Okay, so Herbert, I have a short question. Apart from playing soccer with you and <laughs> saying, <laughs> uh, you uh, when you were describing the vortices, you had the wave function uh, regular at origin. But suppose, and you had used the Levinson's theorem at some stage, but instead the wave function being regular, it could be irregular yet square integrable, and then the Levinson's theorem picks up some corrections. Have you ever considered such cases? Okay, so well, actually the, the, the profile function is irregular at, at the origin. So the gauge field is, so it has to be regular, fully regular. Or, uh, and at spatial infinity to make contact with the free greens function. Okay, so we haven't really looked in, into that, but uh, the, often what actually happens in, in quantum mechanics where you also have solutions that are irregular, uh, uh, but square integrable. So j just think of the uh, spherical well. Uh, those solutions actually are not solutions to the full wave equations. So if you look at the full wave equations rather than uh, in some uh, radial reduction, uh, you would actually pick up a delta function contribution. Yes. Okay, Okay. so so, so in that is in sense, so that's the reason why um, sometimes in for angular momentum zero, you have to discharge, discard uh, those solutions even though they are square integrable. Okay, thank you. Oh, so.
Is there any other question, comment? If not, let's thank Herbert for the beautiful talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your attention.